And hi to everybody. We are the team from Ireland and we all work inside of the Irish prisons, except for we all have very different roles inside the Irish prison. So I'll start by introducing who everybody is and then we can get into a conversation of what we do and why we do it. So in the red T-shirt supporting Liverpool in the corner there is Greg and he is the Community Health Action Coordinator. So he now works for the Irish Red Cross, but he was previously a prison governor. We have Francis Daly, who is the national governor of the Red Cross program and also the current governor of Cloverhill Prison based in Dublin. We have Emmett Conroy, who is the national infection control manager, who has worked very closely with us over the last few years, but particularly in the last year. Mm -hmm. And we have Dr. Graeme Beth Simmons, who is the program director of the Red Cross program inside prisons. And then you have myself, who I am a teacher a PE teacher originally and now a Red Cross teacher and PE teacher and I work for the education and training boards and they provide education into all of the prisons around Ireland. So today we're just going to have a little chat about the Red Cross program itself and then kind of how COVID has affected it and how our volunteers have kind of stepped up to the plate to help Ireland, Ireland's fight against COVID. So Graham, we're going to start with you if you want to give us a background on how the program actually started. Yes, certainly. Uh, thanks, um, Katrina. <clears throat> the program started in 2009. Um, at the time, I'd taken over as the healthcare manager for two prisons, and I did a healthcare audit to find that there was no preventive health um, taking place. So, from my previous life of being in the International Red Cross, we are, um, Maeve Donnelly and I um, started to um, implement this program inside a prison as opposed to where it was originally written for, which is all over the world. And, it was, and it's been very, very successful. It was a, it's an action learning approach. So the prisoner volunteers, they learn in the classroom and they do things in the community. And <clears throat> uh, it was piloted in one prison and evaluated and then it showed such good progress that the director general of the prison service asked us to um, implement it in all prisons in Ireland which we had done by 2014 and the only reason this program works so well is because it's a partnership it's a partnership between the Irish prison service the education and training board and the Irish Red Cross um, the program itself contains um, some mandatory modules uh, that have to be taken by all volunteers, then there are various optional ones. But <clears throat> what it is that they learn about and do projects on is based upon the centrally important community um, assessment. And they undertake that assessment uh, and then we identify what are the topics that they need to do, what do they need to pass information to their peers. Um, and projects are developed based upon uh, that information. So that's where it started. Um, and now, since 2014, um, we continue to and develop the program. Um, there are one or two other components now involving the probation service. Um, but <clears throat> certainly during the, the last or oh, the COVID emergency, um, Emmett will tell you in due course how important it's been um, to have this program in the prison before you get a catastrophe like um, COVID. So, Graham, so it was your vision then to see that this program would work inside of a prison. Yes, absolutely. So how did you convince the Irish Red Cross to allow prisoners, prisoners who are normally seen on the front of the newspaper and mm. Uh, a poor stigma and a negative stigma associated with them. So how did you convince the Irish Red Cross to take a chance to allow prisoners to become volunteers? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, power of persuasion. Um, and basically, um, there was a secretary general who was um, particularly outgoing, um, who was very happy to um, have a go at it. Now, at that time, all around the world, um, you know, nobody had got Red Cross volunteers as prisoners. So, um, yes, it was certainly questioned. It was questioned by the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, but uh, we were able to show in the pilot 
which was the one in Wheatfield in 2009, that there were no problems um, with volunteers being prisoners, as one might have thought, um, and great, a great deal of good was getting done. We also noticed that prisoners that have become volunteers, they seem to change. I mean, you will know that, Katrina, from the people that you have. Um, so not only do they learn skills that are good for health in prisons and for when they leave, leave prison, they also start to get personally developed. And uh, I'm sure you can fill those gaps in. Uh, yeah, so it was a big risk for the Irish Red Cross to allow was, prisoners to become volunteers. Yes, it was. And the main reason uh, you have to think about this is because the most important thing with the Red Cross movement is that the emblem uh, that represents the organization is never uh, inter is does not get a bad name. Um, and I always tell students uh, or um, volunteers uh, in the uh, beginning when we talk to them that um, you know if they do something like, for example, they get an eye, they're allowed to go from uh, landing to landing to deliver messages. Well, you know, what a wonder easy way it would be to move drugs around. Um, so that's one of the key, key things we have to think about. And it's like, it's no different to in a conflict zone that, you know, if you have uh, an ambulance that's got a gun in it, then the people that are concerned are not going to be safe anymore because the emblem has been disparaged. Now, in a prison setting, if we have find a volunteer moving drugs around, there's a good chance that somebody's going to say, hang on a second, and especially in the early days, um, this program's too dangerous, we, we can't do it. But that hasn't, so, happened. It hasn't happened because it was very, very well managed. So Governor Daly, it was a big risk for the Irish Prison Service to allow the empowerment of prisoners as well. Very much so, Katrina. Um, and I suppose the, the su success of the program has been down to that, uh, actually how it was planned and organised from the very outset and the selection of volunteers and taking a few risks. Like it is very important that we are very much kind of a, a risk aware and not risk adverse in, in when, we, when we go to um, selecting our volunteers and the volunteers themselves, the prisoners themselves, it's very important that they have a bit of credibility around the place because they are going around disseminating information that is being taught by the teachers. So we know the information that's been taught is accurate and correct. And that's what we want to get out on the landings. Key messages around health, good health topics, well-being, uh, positive um, attitudes. And then I suppose the partnership, you know, it was it was so important that we built a partnership with the Education Training Board. We have health in our prisons. We have teachers. But we didn't work collabor collaboratively as teams. And the Irish Prison Service, you had the security, the operational side. And now we brought together all of these teams, the Education Training Board, the Irish Red Cross, and the prisoners were trained under the seven fundamental principles. And they worked them to themselves. And that was how uh, I, I actually, I suppose, I was very much a skeptic at the start because mm -hmm. I, was, I was having to go to my operational chiefs and the governors and in, and in other prisons and to actually say that this program works, but because they are, they're very much well-trained. And, uh, and I, I, I do believe that prisoners, uh, who, when they became volunteers, they took it on with, with such, um, I suppose, uh, gusto. And they really, really got the, pro the program and they, they sold it. Like I, I give the example, I suppose, in 2009, when Ireland faced the H1N1 swine flu. So we straight away went into the hand washing um, and infection control techniques around sneezing, coughing etiquette. And they in turn taught the prisoners out on the landings of the good, uh, good etiquette around uh, of that. And I would be proud to say, as who I was assistant governor at the time in, in Wheatfield, that we had no cases of um, the H1N1 swine flu in Wheatfield. And I do firmly believe that that was down to the education that the lads were taught and they then in, in turn disseminated that out in their language. 
yeah. back out into the prison population. And it certainly made our prison a much, much cleaner and a much safer environment for the staff. A mistake we made at the start, we didn't include prison staff. And that was a very important key around the selection of prisoners. Because now you have a, a staff member walking up to a landing or a wing and saying, I'm going on here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You don't tell prison staff, prisoners don't, historically, they don't tell prison staff that that's what they're going to do. So it was key that we actually trained our staff in sensitization and gave them an understanding of what the program was about. So then, you know, we don't want everybody to get involved, but we certainly want to get a, a key members of staff, disciplined staff involved in it to work along with yourself, like the likes of yourself, Katrina, the likes of, um, shall we say, the, the healthcare, the healthcare teams, and to bring information and to work with the prisoners in making the projects work throughout the prison to make the prison community. And it's very much a community setting, uh, no different than what it is, as Graham said earlier, in relation to the communities out in, in the community. The prison is a community and that's what we live and work by. Absolutely. But there was definitely fear in that community at the start when they started because there was a new role for everybody involved and it was a new collaborative product. Uh, Greg, I could see that you were nodding along saying that there was definitely fear. So at the time you were governor of Mount Joy Prison, probably yeah. well, the most well-known prison in Ireland. Yeah. And like Fran I was friends with Francis and you, Francis, and through work. And she came knocking on the door looking to expand this program. She started telling me all about it. And she didn't tell me she was a skeptic back then. Because if she had, I probably wouldn't have taken it on. But um, I was a skeptic at the beginning in relation to it because, listen, prisons are prisons and, you know, things are security conscious, basically based. And, like, you know, to say that uh, volunteers will have access around the prison to promote good health and everything else, you're sort of saying that doesn't really match up with the security aspect of a prison. So it was taking chances and everything else, but uh, we were convinced to go out and see the graduation in Wheatfield to see what this program was all about. And straight away, the first thing that hit me uh, in the years even uh, that I was working in the prison service was how driven the volunteers were and the impact they were having on their own community. And I always know that, like, you know, it's... It comes a lot easier when it's peer driven, more so. If I was telling someone to do something, it'll take a while, whereas one of their own tells them to do it, you know, it's nearly done immediately. And it's like what Francis says there, you know, you have to take a risk sometimes with the volunteers. They have to be able to walk to walk and talk to talk among their own uh, population as well. So, yeah, it's one of the most positive impacts that I had in my career in the prison service to see how it worked for the benefit of those that were incarcerated. So it's um, it gave me an insight also then when I retired, I knew what was required then to make it work, you know. And I think it's like everything else. It's like Liverpool and Man United. You can't succeed unless you have a good team around you. And like, and that's the way I looked on it. That for the program to work, for I worked, I needed a good team around me. Um, its components had to be in place, and like the partnership had to be there. So from operationally, I had a very good team, and then we had ETB and the Red Cross supporting us as well. And then, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that collaboration really, really works. And I think it offered an awful lot of benefits to every part of the collaboration as well. From a teaching point of view, we would often be teaching in the school, inside your prison, and you wouldn't really have any dealings with anybody else. So for us, it was a great way of opening up the doors to yeah. meeting other people within the prison, getting to know the healthcare, getting to know the other services that were in the prison and working together with the main goal of making these lads and ladies have a better future, have to get their behavior to change and to see for themselves that they do have value to give to the world and to hopefully change that behavior so that they won't come back to prison in the future. So when we started off, Emmett, who is now the head of the infection control, he was a nurse and we actually collaborated together, Emmett, at the start. But it was a different kind of class and it was probably a different kind of approach to healthcare for yourself as well. Yeah, no, it was. I mean, at the very beginning, uh, like yourselves, I mean, I trusted Graham. Graham was my boss at the time. He said, I have a project that I'd like to get your teeth into. 
So I, I followed him and I ended up in the classroom with you, where we, we had a group of volunteers. <laughs> and and we, were, we, were, we were tasked with um, teaching them. And, you know, it, it, it was, I, I'm used to teaching patients, um, but I'm never used to teaching others to teach others. So through peer, we basically worked together, developed this peer to peer program where you and I would leave the classroom. I would start talking to them. If you remember a few years ago, Ireland had a big TB outbreak. And unfortunately, many prisoners and staff uh, got TB. Some staff brought it home to their families. Um, so, I mean, that was that's something we noticed, that we had no conduit by which we could actually train or teach prisoners. This program fitted that gap. Um, it was, as it turned out, I mean, today now, I mean, this program and the volunteers, they're an arm of infection control. Without them, I would not be able to uh, access the prison population in, in the way I can. Um, so we bring them into the classroom. I can teach about TB, uh, teach about hand washing, as Francis said. That's where we started off. We started off with the basics. Hand hygiene, single most effective way to stop the transmission of any pathogen. So we, we taught how to wash their hands. We got them glow boxes. We sent them out to the landings. They basically went out and done demonstrations. They created posters. I mean, we have a multinational, multicultural society as our prison population. So, I mean, instead of writing it all out in English, they drew posters, pictures, and uh, the pictures tell the huge stories. And they were able, to, and because they were respected, as Francis said, respected by their peers, they were listened to. I mean, I could walk down there and be blue in the face and do it, some prisoners would ignore me. But when they see their own and uh, neighbours, you know, because, I mean, their, their landings are the streets, they live in the community together, teaching them after coming out of the classroom, they're learning from us, and then teaching them and seeing the positive effects around it. Uh, it, it was actually, it, it was groundbreaking. And basically, we start building on that platform for the last few years. And today, I'm, I'm glad to say, uh, in uh, the Irish prison setting, we have no deaths attributed to COVID. I mean, which is a remarkable achievement. And I honestly, honestly believe not only is it down to all the hard work of all the staff, but the buy-in from the prisoners, the hard work the prisoners and the volunteers have done. And that, again, goes right back to where we started. The prisoners learning in the classroom and going out. I mean, prior to COVID arriving, we had done so much work. Myself and Ray, Graham actually sat down and wrote an infection control module that was signed off by Geneva. Now that's been rolled out across, across the world for the volunteers in this group, where we, we looked at the basics of how is, how is infection transmitted? about breaking the chain of infection. Prior to COVID arriving, we had done for years hand washing techniques, coughing etiquette, hygiene. We introduced an alcohol-free uh, hand sanitizer across the estate in all 12 prisons that the prisoners knew it worked. And the reason they knew it worked and they killed bacteria, viruses, is, um, was simply because the prisoners communicated all the data around the product. Because they trusted and that trust was built up with the volunteers, the prisoners believed in the product. And uh, we also done some dining and doffing with, with prisoners, showing them how to put on PP, how to take it off, particularly prisoners who are working in, say, high risk areas and laundries and that. And um, we've also, I mean, it's been absolutely fantastic, absolutely fantastic for us to have a system, to have a conduit by which we could communicate to every prison in the country through these volunteers. We were able to, first thing what we've done is we educate every prisoner about a COVID. We got to be educated about the signs and symptoms, what to look out for. This is before Ireland, this is before COVID hit Ireland. They were already out in the land promoting this. They had pictures up, explaining what COVID was going to look like. We knew it was coming. So when finally COVID did arrive, we were able to step up because we were prepared for it. We had our PPE, we had our, we had our sanitizers everywhere. We had the education done. We had confidence built in the community in which the volunteers were working. And this is all based on the work that they, that they have done. Then when COVID did arrive, there was panic. But our volunteers working together with yourselves, uh, they produced two communication networks. One was a leaflet that they actually wrote down. And basically, I work with Graham, Greg, Francis, yourself, Katrina. And we used to uh, get the latest up-to-date information of where we were with COVID. That was put in a simple language through uh, education, through cell drops. That was communicated to all the prisoners. Then, unfortunately, we got our first cases of COVID in the prison. And, our, and prisoners then who come in from the community, they were subjected to um, isolation, to quarantine. So that's where they'd be kind of a very restricted uh, uh, regime for up to 14 days. Now, you can, you can imagine, you can only imagine the effect that has on someone's mental health. So the volunteers, yet again, they actually created a specific information leaflet 
with loads of games for mental health and awareness for all these people who were subjected to these regimes. And I have to say the impact has only been positive. So I'm glad to say today we still have no um, deaths attributed to COVID in our prison system, which is a remarkable achievement. It absolutely is. And it's brilliant that we can thank the Red Cross volunteers for their role in that, because I think you're right, there was massive fear um, amongst the prison when it when it did break out. But they were able to say, well, we've done the preparation work because infection control has been on our module list for the last 10 years. And it's something that they're probably sick of seeing us washing our hands and showing them how to wash their hands. And I know in our place, what we do is we show them how to wash their hands and we get them to sing happy birthday as they're doing it. So then it's always a bit of laugh then as they're, as they're doing it. So that's how long you need to wash your hands for. But apart from infection control, Graham, the volunteers have been involved in many projects over the years that have been really, really successful. Yes. So what kind of projects do they do? Oh, well, um, basically, um, uh, they um, do activities that help to prevent infection. We've talked about some of those. Uh, tuberculosis awareness, um, because... If you've got, if you teach volunteers simple things like the basic signs of what could be TB, and they're in the community, um, the, the volunteers are taught not to say, point the finger and say, oh, you've got TB. Um, it's to encourage them to go and get uh, seen in the healthcare department. Now, what that does, of course, it keeps prisoners and staff safe. Some of the other very useful projects that were done um, were. Uh, in hepatitis C screening, uh, HIV screening, um, which was done in Mount Joy Prison, where we got 80% of the population come to get tested. Now, there is no way on earth without the volunteers um, would that number of uh, uh, prisoners come and get themselves tested. That, then earlier, you will remember, Katrina, we did in Clover Hill, there was an HIV testing uh, done. Uh, and again, I think it was 57% that turned up, which was great. So the volunteers in those cases, you see, were able to actually encourage others to come and get tested, which would never have happened apart from that. Um, other uh, uh, topics um, would include non-communicable diseases. <clears throat> and that's because non-communicable diseases uh, are, are, are still the biggest killer uh, around the globe. Um, violence prevention, drug overdose prevention, very important. Um, and uh, various topics to do with uh, social inclusion, encouraging people to uh, look after each other's interests, be tolerant, and so on. So, so they always uh, don't have to be big projects. They can be just no, small no. projects. Greg, do you remember what your first project was in Mountjoy? Oh, yes. oh, I do indeed. So how could I forget? It was a very, actually it was quite a simple one, but it, it, it posed a few problems for us to start. And Mountjoy, by his nature, um, each wing is three stories. Uh, so the lads would queue up for their food at the food servery. And um, they would get their food and go back to their cell then to, to eat their food in their cell. But on the way back then, you'd have to walk underneath the different landings and there was dust and various things in the air. And one of the main things that the lads asked for was, could they have a food covering for their meals at mealtimes? Like a hotel? <laughs> like a hotel, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, it's, it's only when it was raised that it sort of sank in. Well, would, would I like that now to be walking back with me food like that? So it made sense in a sense. But like in, I knew it had to be achievable, this, because the credibility of the volunteers was huge in this basis of it. So in fairness to Josephine, who is the teacher like yourself in Mount Joy, who's been rock solid with us from day one, we started looking for them. And the cost of them was absolutely crazy in some places. But it was an old um, store up in Fisborough there, and Bob's, and if you ever want something, he always has it. And Josephine went in and she said, by any chance would you have some food covers? Oh, God, I have. How many do you want? 800. So with that, she got them, and she got them at a very reasonable cost then as well. So it was great to fix. It was done. The volunteers were informed then that we had them, and then they distributed them then as well, as we were going around the surveys. So the credibility for the volunteers was huge then at that point. No longer did they see them then 
this is just a talking shop. Uh, you won't get that done here. You know, they're only bringing us along for a journey and get nothing done. Uh, so when the rest of the population seen they actually got succeeded, they said, whoa, OK, maybe we can work this and see where we go with it and we improve our facilities and everything else. And they're living and work, you know, living conditions and everything else. It staff's working conditions too. So, you know, it was a win-win right around it for everybody in, in a sense. So I think the most important thing really is that when volunteers come with projects and that that you want to do, that they are achievable, you know, and if they're not achievable, to be told why they're not achievable. Exactly. You know? And, you know, that probably brings us on to the likes of the why, how do we go about achieving all this, uh, in a sense. So there's a team in every prison, and I'll probably lead into the chat group, Katrina. Will that all right? Yeah, absolutely. So, like, in, in each prison, there's a team, and, like, there's a team of stakeholders, and there's the operational side of things, which will be led by the, his, the governor and his team, and his team would consist of the chief and the ACO and staff. You'd also have the healthcare staff as well, which would be represented by the chief nurse officer and a nurse officer who would be designated then as well with that role. And these are extra roles that they take on apart from their normal duties as well. We would have our teacher, the assistant psychologist, and then we would have other members of the team then as well when required if we're taking on a certain project that would sit and what is known as the Community Health Action Committee. And these, that's a mouthful. So what we normally have is called a chat, you know. And these meetings are held monthly. And my role since I retired now is I'm the coordinator for this. And I suppose I had an insight about what was required to make each work. And one of the biggest things was that the team is in place in each prison to make it work. And like sometimes we're faced with challenges through either retirements, promotions, people moving on or transferring. It's filling the gaps and making sure the team is in place in each prison. And the most important part is that the meetings take place every month. And I suppose the one piece of the jigsaw that I left out of the chat group was the representation of the volunteers at that meeting. Yeah. Now, it's not the full group attend. There will be lads selected from the, each group to represent the group at the meeting. And it's very important that we talked about the communication, and it's a two-way street. For example, if we want to get something done, to communicate to the rest of the volunteers, it would go through the representatives at the table. It also was a voice for the volunteers to raise issues that they might have in relation to the program at the meeting. Because the most important, you have the decision makers around the table that could solve the issues that were being raised. And sometimes, you know, um, you might feel you're running up against a brick wall. And then you go to the meeting, and, you know, and you raise the topic, and all of a sudden the issue is solved. I don't believe, you know, I never believe in problems in such. I always believe in the solutions around it. So I carried that forward even into this. And I suppose I had a good working relationship and I was able to walk in and I knew a lot of people in a sense from that point of view. So I was able to pull the teams together. And I think the whole thing about teamwork, but the most important as well, that the volunteers are represented and they have a voice. And, you know, they feel comfortable and they're welcomed at those meetings. And it's not a case of, and being spoken down to or anything like that. It's on a level playing field and everybody is there for the right reason in relation to the programme. You know? Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest benefits that the students or the volunteers that I have dealt with, they always tell me that they always feel listened to. So in order for them to feel listened to and respected, that in turn then increases their confidence. And that's the most rewarding part for me as a teacher is so they do their training over a six month period and then they end up being a volunteer in whatever prison that they're in while they're in prison. But for me to see them developing right in front of your eyes is absolutely incredible. Like to, to grow in value, to know that they have something to say and they will be respected and listen to their personal development and their personal empowerment is, is absolutely beautiful to see. And for the last 10 years, we've been building up kind of people in that way. Uh, with our face-to-face -face classes, with our projects works that we're doing, whether they're big or small. And then last March, 
COVID hit us all. So Francis, from a governor's point of view, when COVID hit, was it just automatic lockdown or what happened in the Irish prisons? Well, I suppose in Ireland, I got their first case in, in February of 2020. And then on the 12th of March, shock, horror, uh, everything stopped. Teachers were pulled out of the schools. Visits uh, were gone. And like we didn't, uh, as Emmett said earlier, we had a lot of a lot in place in relation to we had all the posters. We had all the signage. We had all the hand uh, gels. We had everything like that. But as a governor, your priority is to keep people out of cells and get them engaged in activities. And now all of a sudden we were going, we were facing almost lockdown every day. And uh, and it was also the fear of the unknown, Katrina. We didn't know what this pandemic was. As I said to you, our priority is to keep people engaged. And now we're telling them, no, we're going to leave you locked up in a yeah. cell. And like this is totally against the Irish prison service uh, policies and procedures around keeping them out, keeping them engaged, getting them, getting them, um, you know, fresh air and all of that. And then it went to a stage where like every every prisoner who was coming in and um, the, the nurse had to go out to the main gate to see them and had to do like you know, dress up in PPE. So that was, you know, it's a frightening experience for somebody if they're certainly coming in first time and also for them to get to have engagement because visits were stopped. So it was important that um, you know, the prison service acted quickly and they did put in virtual visits and, uh, you know, phone calls, but it did take a little bit of time. But it was important that our the, that the prisoners, um, you know, that the volunteers was thankfully were able to actively still work within the prison and disseminate that information, that key messages out there. And the, the, the lads themselves and the ladies actually saw, well, this is not just the prison. It's not our fault that this has happened. This is worldwide. And they were seeing it on the news. And it was awful, like to, to say, no, you're not, you can't go in here. And when you come into prison, you're going to spend 14 days in quarantine. And like, you know, from this is where it was going on. And for, from an operational point of view, it was a nightmare trying to accommodate people safely and to try and make sure. But in humane, humanely as well, like no showers, no nothing. You couldn't get your hours exercise. You went into quarantine for, for 14 days. And, and the, the numbers didn't decrease coming into prisons. They still ma maintained it, albeit visit our uh, courts. The courts started through vid video links. Um, and yes, there was less movement around. From a staffing perspective, we now were saying that like, there was a national, um, that uh, Emmett sits on, uh, an emergency response team was set up. So that it was very much on a national level that all the decisions were coming from. And this is how we were going to run, you know, everything was the same, but no matter what prison you were actually in. But from the 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 you know, the likes of saying, no, you're not going to get a visit, you're not but even for food, you know, the, that um people staff had to go out for different times, they had to break up into different pods. They were now not allowed, say, go and meet somebody if somebody was working on A division. They couldn't meet uh, somebody working on B division. They had to stay all day on their on A division. And it was all that much unknown. And it was very much on a trial and error, I'd say, Emmett, really, from how we 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 got to, to the stage that we are today. But I think yeah, it was down and I think to that we were very lucky. lucky. We were very lucky, Emmett. Well, not lucky because it was down to the hard work and the preparation that like, am I right in saying that we had no cases in the prison up until nearly October? Yeah, no, I think our first, our first case was in, I'm going to say, uh, June. We, we, okay, we, so uh, on the outside, yeah. the cases were rising and rising, and on the inside, the cases were yes. nearly at zero. And I think the prisoners were quite proud of that as well, yeah. that we, they were first, doing the work to keep it out. Yeah, our first prison uh, transmission was around October, I believe. Yeah. You know, so, uh, but look, it, it was fantastic. I mean, uh, as Francis said, I mean, the decisions were made nationally, fine. And that was good. But because we had the volunteers in place, we could go then and communicate and explain why we're doing everything. So they were able to go out then and basically dissolve any issues on the floor among the prison population, resolve any anxiety. So they understood exactly why we were doing, why we were implementing each control and it was to protect them and the, the wider community. So, I mean, we got huge buy-in and that was down to the work of the volunteers, for sure. Greg? Yeah, just to go on about how COVID really affected us and the communication aspect of it. And I suppose the strength of each team that was established in the prisons, um, you know, from a staff point of view, from right from five aides to ACOs, to chiefs, to governors, 
that they were in there with the volunteers and we were outside and we were trying to get that message in there. You know, so one, as we said, was that from operationally, we dealt with the governor and then likes yourselves were dealing with from an education point of view. And we were able to hold those, Josephine was able, lucky enough to hold focus groups in relation to getting good information, simple information in on the ground through the newsletter that was developed with IPS and that. And like, you know, there's 33, 34 editions gone in, which was keeping everybody informed up to date of really what was happening. And also trying to deal with some mental health issues then as well through depression, anxiety and all that type of stuff and tips and ways on how to manage. And the role the volunteer played, played in that and getting that uh, delivered around the, the, the prisons. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's uh, there's been a lot going on. It, people had to change the way they worked. You had to think outside the box and stay positive. And I suppose that's probably been the hardest part I mean, because at the start it was easy because nobody knew how long this was going to, to go on for. And I suppose the, the more it went on, the more we had to reinforce the positivity in relation to the positive message and uh, out there and not let the negative impacts that's, that are out there impact on it, on the program. And, you know, the volunteers were huge in that aspect of it because they stuck to the line they, with the right information and even around the likes of vaccines and everything else now, which is the next line that we're doing. The positive message that they're getting out, uh, they're among their own, is, is amazing. And, like, you, you can't buy that. You just can't buy it. You know, and, and as you said, Greg, there's no problems, just solutions. Yeah. Sorry, Emmett. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just going to say, there was a lot of misinformation around the vaccines. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, the Devon has done huge work and, and uh, sent out a questionnaire. We were able to establish what the, what was that misinformation was and through that then correct it, educate the volunteers around the correct information and then they could go back to the prison population and re-educate them. So as a result, then more and more prisoners, he's saying now, are looking for the vaccine. So it is, it's good. Yes, it's excellent. Excellent. John, do you want to ask us a question? Yes. Hi, everyone. That's, that has been, it's incredible being able to listen to something that's so positive, to be honest. I mean, today's been full on the news desk, really, of lots of positive engagement, but also that collective team effort that needs, you know, right from the very top of someone like, you know, as the governor, like Francis, being able to be willing to be risk aware, but not risk averse. Um, I think schools could learn a lot about that when it comes to social media, actually. There we go, just a side, just a side swipe there. But I think for me, this is the value of the, the new network is the sharing of these stories because these things are not seen. They're not stories for the mainstream media. Um, but how do we get out the fact that, that something that you've done is, as a way of engaging people, volunteers, is also being able to help you to respond to an emergency? So it's almost like you're proactive, you know, you're, you're almost like pre-positioning of PPE in, in locations and stuff and signage and stuff. I think it's really impressive. What sort of things do you think from this experience, if you look at the whole Red Cross project, would each of you be able to um, share with someone else? What would you say is the most important thing if someone was thinking about a, a project like this, engaging, engaging uh, prisoners, but also taking staff on that journey like Greg mentioned? Well, I mean, it's Graham here. Um, I think one key thing I would say is that if we we're if we were going to help another uh, country, for example, to implement it, um, would be to make sure that there is good sensitization so that the staff are well trained, they understand why the program is working, um, because and see for themselves um, how it can benefit staff as well as prisoners. I think that's very important. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think the communication around it is is uh, really, really key to keep the communication lines open. But also, as you said, John, to find the right people who are willing to take the risks. Like Francis was an absolute hero for us to be able to take that first risk. And that led to everybody else. Because Daddy, she's very, Daddy. very convincing. So mm -hmm. if she can convince Greg to take a risk, she can convince anyone around the world to take <laughs> that risk. <laughs> I, John, if I could come in there, sorry. I think it's also very important that we're able to listen. 
and hear what's actually being said. Like some people are very, very good communicators and speaking, but they don't actually listen. And most of all, they actually don't hear what's being said. For example, like at a, I remember being at a, a chat meeting at one day and uh, I was chairing it. And, uh, you know, the staff says, well, what are you doing for us? You're doing everything for the prisoners. And what are you doing for us? So what we did then was we did a well-being week, you know, for both the staff and the prisoners. We got in guest speakers. We got in, you know, we gave them an apple and a bottle of water. Simple, very cheap, but that's what it was. And when we were looking at people, to, we were encouraging people to drink more water, you know, and we asked them for what topics that we would they would like for people to come in and talk about, or that, you know, that the guest speakers would come in and to get them involved. Do little sport events. Isn't that it, Katrina? Get them involved, you know, but on the same week, we're in both of them collaboratively together. And it's it's an amazing, it, it really, really is. And it's very, it's very minimal, but it's very, it's very achievable. Yeah. And I think that inclusion part is really important because uh, prisons are very negative environments, very small environments, and they are communities and gossip spreads like wildfire inside a prison. So if you leave someone out of something and they get the hump about that, that goes around quickly. Whereas if you include everyone, so pick up that phone, write that email, just include everyone, let everybody know what's happening. And then hopefully it'll be all positive from there. And we made those mistakes, John, there's no denying that. Like we made lots of mistakes along the way. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of mistakes we'd like to change, but you have to take that what, what you can, you know, and go, go with it. Well, I would yeah, just, I would just say, sorry, go on, Greg. Uh, I would just say that no matter what I would take out, uh, it had to be, the program has to be driven and the people doing it have to be driven as well, in a sense. And they must be prepared to take to go that extra yard uh, to make it succeed. Um, mm -hmm. So it's sometimes, as Francis says, like you know, you have to you have to battle against to, to convince people, uh, because culture in some ways is very hard to change as well. Uh, and some people are just so set in the ways they won't change no matter what you do. But I think if you believe in something um, passionately, uh, you'll get it across the line. And I always feel that there's always, the, you know, have the team in place, um, like-minded people, um, anything is possible. And I think, uh, like I say, the, the programme itself is completely replicable. It can be, um, repl it can be replicated in any country. Um, we've, done, we've assisted Australian Red Cross. Um, Emmett, I sent him a couple of years ago um, to uh, Honduras, um, and you might tell them about um, how that went, Emmett. Yes, uh, we rolled out the program in the Honduras prison, uh, in the prison system out there. Uh, I put on a, a week um, sensational program uh, in true translation, and it worked. Uh, when I was out there that time, there had been 182 murders in that prison. And once they rolled out the program, uh, Graham reviewed it a year later, there had been zero, zero murders. They really clenched this program, accepted it for what it is, and start respecting it. And then the prison, that prison out there, Tamara, became a safe zone. So, I mean, and for any, I would say that any health authority out there providing health care in a prison, look at this program. Because mm -hmm. we would not have achieved and be where we are today without the volunteers. I can say that for sure. And we are actually currently recording the voices of the volunteers at the moment. So in a few weeks time, actually probably even next week on the Irish Prison Service Twitter, there will be a link where you'll be actually able to hear the voices of the prisoners and what impact this program has had on it. So if anybody wants to check that out, more than welcome. That's wonderful. We'll make sure that we keep our eye on your Twitter feed then and, um, and make sure that that gets supported by ourselves and, and brought into the network and, and the way that it's shared. I mean, I said it's, it's inspirational stuff, guys. You know, I mean, I've, I've been in prison. But I've also been in the army and I can see the logic of pre-positioning supplies and stuff like that. I've kind of learned that sort of thing. And so to have PPE kind of ready to go, um, I think there's there's a lot to be learned when it comes. Maybe, maybe you could even teach our government over here. That'd be quite cool <laughs> about pre-positioning some uh, emergency supplies and, and getting things done in, in the right way. And I think um, it's, it's a real exemplar that you've got there. And I'm absolutely delighted. I know Rob is and I know John Scott is as well that you guys have taken the time to speak to us. So thank you very much for your time. No problem. Thanks, John. Thanks, Rob.